Good afternoon, everyone. It's again wonderful to have you here for noontime prayer and the reading of Psalm 31 today. My wife Nancy is sitting here with me and my mom, Ruth. And I just uh, really appreciate your taking the time out of your day to join me today. Even since Sunday, I've been watching some news and I hope that we don't lose sight of the injustice that was done to George Floyd. It was horrendous. And I think a lot of people are trying to draw our attention away from that injustice. So in this time, I, I just ask that you, you would pray along with me for the Floyd family, for Afri African Americans across our nation who are living in fear off, oftentimes. Several years ago, I think it was in 2006, 2007, I went on a Sankofa journey, which was a, a bus tour through the Southland, through Georgia and Mississippi. And what I saw was horrendous. Uh, and yet I see similar things here. We were in a group and we were asked, how many of you Caucasians, how many of you white people have ever been stopped for running through a neighborhood or walking through a neighborhood. And not one hand went up. When the moderator asked how many of you black people have been stopped in a neighborhood or for running through a neighborhood, for jogging through a neighborhood, or for walking through a neighborhood, almost every hand shot up. And so we don't perceive what African Americans live with. We just can't see it because it doesn't, we don't experience it. And so I ho hope you take the time to be still and listen to God's voice and listen to his love for the African American people who've undergone such grief in, in this nation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent the son in the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We have the answer, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ what he has done for us on the cross, his goodness to us and to the world. Let's pray. Father, even after a, another night of riots and, and fires and smoke, and I've also seen that some police officers have been shot, one killed, or maybe even two, I don't, I don't remember. Father, our, our nation is in turmoil right now. Some of the tur turmoil we know is being stirred up by outside forces. But I think those outside forces are meant to get our, our attention off the matter at hand, the injustice at hand. So we, we cry out for justice today. Justice, justice for our entire nation. And in so praying, that's a scary prayer, Lord, because we're crying out for justice for all the wrongdoing in our society. But today we cry out for justice for the African-American families and African-American people who keep losing loved ones Let us listen with clarity to your voice. I pray that you'd put an end to the violence. I pray that you would put an end to the injustice to black people all across our nation. The only way I know how to actually arrive at any resolution is by 
having a great awakening, awakening in our nation, Lord, in all ethnicities, that you would call this nation back to its knees. We have chosen a horrifically sinful course, Lord, as a nation. And there are consequences to the bad choices we make. And then when those consequences come up, we, we say, why are you doing this to us, Lord? Help us to see our foolishness as a nation. Help us to f see the foolishness of worshiping the creation, worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Bring this nation and this world to its knees that we might receive grace and mercy in our time of need. I pray for the Floyd family, Lord. I pray for comfort. I pray for strength. I pray for the power of your grace. And Father, if, by, if perchance they don't know you, I pray that they would come to know you. That sweet saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as these riots continue, there's a chance that there's going to be a big uptick in cases of COVID-19 virus again, Lord. Time will tell. In the meantime, give us wisdom beyond our own thinking, discernment beyond our own knowledge, insight beyond our own understanding. I pray for spiritual eyes, illuminated eyes, Lord. From Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and following, I pray, Dear God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may you give to each of us watching and listening today and those later watching and listening, may you give to us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that the eyes of our heart may be enlightened so that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the riches of your glory, of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of your power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of your might, which you brought about in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And you have put all things in subjection under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, Father, again, I pray that you would give us hearts that are enlightened, that you would give us the Holy Spirit of wisdom and, and revelation, in the knowledge of you. May you teach us to hear your voice so clearly through your scripture, through the community of believers who surround us. And when they are not listening, Father, I just pray that we would hear through the anointing that we have received. Teach us to hear your voice, that still small voice that speaks to us in our inner being. Sometimes impressions sometimes words formed, sometimes instant understanding. 
we look to you, Lord. In these days, let us not rely on our, on our own insight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely on your own, on your own insight. In all your ways, we acknowledge you, Lord, and you will make straight our paths. So make our straight paths, our, our paths straight through this pandemic, through these perilous times. We entrust our lives and the lives of our nation and world into your hands. We pray that your will would be done. Your will be done. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, thanks for joining me today. When I went to get on, Facebook had changed the entire uh, look of the page to start the live stream. It's like, oh, I wonder if I can do it. But I was able to figure it out. Everything was in a different place and looks a little bit uh, sleeker. That's good. We'll see how it works. I discovered last time I did the psalm, I had too many videos in the psalm. So that's what created the, uh, where I, uh, the video wasn't catching up with my voice. At least my voice kept going through the whole thing. But I looked back at it and every eight minutes or so, the video would, would slow down and not catch up. So hopefully we won't have that happen today. Again, welcome. I'm glad you're here with us. Today we look at Psalm 31. Again, I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. It's a Psalm of David. Let's read it and then we'll work through it. In you, O Lord, I, I, take, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me, rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your namesake, you will lead me and guide me. You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. In your hand, I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who regard vain idols. But I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness, because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul, and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief. My soul and my body also for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed me because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I am forgotten as a dead man. Out of out of mind, I'm like a broken vessel. For I've heard the slander of many, terror is on every side. While they, while they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God, my times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you. Before the sons of men, you hide them in secret place, in the secret place of your presence. From the conspiracies of man, 
You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you, O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. So again, we're working through Psalm 31 today. Uh, it's the instructions at the beginning of the psalm, part of the Hebrew text, are for the choir director, for that Le Levitical choir. We don't know what that means other than it, it, because it was a psalm of David, they did something different in regards to the psalm whether they sang it antiphonally, two sections, or a, we don't know how they did it, but someday we'll get to answer, have all these questions answered. Now let's dive in. So the psalm is broken up into five or six sections, actually six, but the first five kind of uh, create a mirror as almost like a chiasmus, but it's not individually, it's by section. And so I'm not going to get into the chiasmus today. I don't think there is one in this. This is a psalm that's extremely difficult to, uh, how do I say, outline. It's, every commentary I picked up have had a different outline to it. Only two had a similar outline. And I like their outline, so that's what I went with. But this first section, let's read through it. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. This is Psalm of David. He's praying to Yahweh, O Lord. Again, anytime we see that capital letters, at least in the New American Standard Bible, but many other versions use the same short of hand if, um, to designate the name Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, in the Hebrew. And we know, as I've often said, that this is Jesus, because he came on the scene and said, Before Abraham was, I am. And as we saw on Sunday, when the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, said, well, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus remarkably says to her, I am the one who is speaking to you. I am. So in that, he was claiming not only to be the Messiah, but he was claiming to be Yahweh, God in the flesh. In you, O Lord, in you, Jesus, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. And so the idea there is that if we've taken refuge in God, and yet he lets us succumb to the attack of the enemy. He lets us succumb to an unjust death. Then we will be put to shame. His name will be put to shame. Let me never be ashamed because you didn't show up. In your righteousness, deliver me. So out of the integrity of God's heart, he's asking God to deliver him. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Don't delay. Sometimes we pray and God delays. It, it, there's always three answers to prayer. Yes, no. Well, actually four. Yes, no. Silence and wait. So here he's asking him, God to be a quick responder in prayer. Be to me a rock of strength. Now look, notice in this psalm, I put some rocks behind in the scene here. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. David frequently uses this image of rock, stronghold, a strong tower, those kinds of images. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. That's an odd thing because he says, be to me a rock of strength. And then he says, but you are my rock and fortress. So how can it be? One of the commentaries I read suggested that it's, we have what we know by faith. We know that he's our rock. We know that he's our refuge. But then bringing it into the reality of our experience, my current experience and your current experience. So we can say with David, Jesus, you are my rock and my fortress. But now into the reality of my our circumstances, your circumstances, my circumstances. 
Be to me today a rock of strength, a, a stronghold to save me. A whole image of a, 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 of a stronghold, a sealed in. For David, it, it wouldn't have necessarily been a building or a fortress in that, that sense. He would escape into the mountains and find fortresses in the mountains, places he could hide out, caves, and so on. And so it's talking more about natural formations than it is talking about man-made for formations here. For you are my rock and my fortress. When he was fleeing from Saul, we see him frequently fleeing into the mountains. When he's fleeing from Absalom, he flees over the Mount of Olives and out towards the wilderness. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. This reminds me of Psalm 23. You will guide us or you will lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. So very much even, not even, but very much for us as Christians, the Christian life is a life that is a led life, a guided life. And it's led no longer directly by Jesus in, in the sense of him being on the planet in a body that I can physically follow. No, now we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. And of course, Jesus is living in our hearts, mediated by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't think there's any better prayer than to ask God to teach us to be led of this Holy Spirit, to guide us in our daily life. Today, lead me, Lord. Teach me to walk in your spirit and to live in your spirit. In your spirit. Again, to walk was an uh, image of life back then. Everywhere they went, they walked. So to walk was to live and to live was to walk. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for, for me. So we know from the last section of the psalm that he's in a city that's been besieged about by the enemy. And so maybe they're growing hungry in the city. We don't know exactly the, the case. If you think about it, David lived for many, many years, for over 80 years, I think, if I remember right. And he was he reigned for over 40 years. In an, and prior to his reigning, he was always doing battles with his 600 or so men. And even as king, he was a very bloody king. He, he was always fighting the surrounding uh, Canaanites and the the peoples that were surrounding the nation of Israel. And so here he's got, so in all of that fighting, we don't have a record of all his battles. We know that there was things that happened to him that we don't know anything about. And so here he's been in a city and his enemy has snuck up and surrounded the city and now has besieged them, trying to starve them out until they can invade in this stronghold. Here it would be an actual fortress of a city. Or maybe it's a, a, a besieged up in the mountains in a cave or in, in one of his valleys or whatever wherever he's hiding out. We're not really told. That's probably more likely to the psalm. But get the language here. You, you will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. So they have set a one of those kinds of traps we used to make as little kids, only we wouldn't use a net. We would use cardboard boxes and a stick and a piece of string. And you would put the box up like this, put the string under or the stick under it, tie the string to the stick and then get about 30 feet away and put breadcrumbs under the box and wait for the sparrow or the pigeon to come under the box and, and then we could catch the birds. I think we were only successful one time when I was little in Tacoma catching a bird that way. They were smarter than we were. They, they saw that contraption and said, are you out of your mind? I'm not going to go under that thing. But we did get a pigeon one time to go under it. And of course, we let it go as soon as we caught it. But they have laid that kind of trap only using a net. It, it's, the, it's a fowler's net, a, a person who's trying to catch birds. For you are my strength. And then he reminds God that he is his strength. And it really, he's also reminding himself. For you are my strength. And he says, into your hands, or into your hand, I commit my spirit. You ransom me, O Lord, God of truth. These very words 
are, we, we find on Jesus' lips on the cross. So if you just think about this whole section as um, what David is getting at, we see that it's, it's a prayer. It's, it's a request. He's asking God, and you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me not be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear, ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be my rock, my stronghold. Pull me out of the net that they've put me in. And then lastly, into your hand I commit my spirit. So we begin with prayer. And that's always a good place to begin. So oftentimes we, prayer becomes our last resort, does it not? Uh, as materialistic modern Americans. Oh, to learn to go to, to God in the first breath in the first step, in the first decision, in the first action. And then we have those last words, into your hands I commit my spirit. We see in Luke 23, verse 46, this is Jesus on the cross at the very last moments of his life. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And so you see it in capital letters there in the NASB. And so anytime the NASB uses capital letters like that, they're saying that that is a quotation from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Scriptures. And so Jesus is quoting from Psalm 31 while he's hanging on the cross. At the very last moments of his life, it's from this psalm, this is the psalm he's thinking about in those last few minutes of his life, in those last few, maybe 30 minutes of his life. Likely, Jesus had memorized much of the psalms as a good Hebrew child. They would, uh, that was part of their instructions, was to memorize the scriptures, and especially the psalms. And so I can see or understand or hear Jesus on the cross quietly reciting this, po this uh, Hebrew poem of David to himself. And as we work, see it, work through it, you will see that almost all of it can apply directly to Jesus while he hangs on the cross. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed, even though he's been stripped naked and put on the cross. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. As he's hanging in agony on the cross, be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. Jesus is willing to go through death. But once he enters into death, it's up to God the Father to raise him because he had emptied himself of the privileges of his deity, according to Philippians 2. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me through this mess I'm in. You will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. Everything done by Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin and by uh, Annas, the, the high priest. The, who, Annas and Caiaphas were father, or father and son-in-law, father-in-law and son-in-law, and they were sharing the high priest's role that year. They had secretly laid a net for him at night. They weren't supposed to try him at night. And then Jesus, qu quoting this psalm, says, Into your hands... I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me. Well, actually, Jesus is ransoming the world. But in turn, God has ransomed Jesus, meaning that he will do whatever it takes to bring him through, to bring him to life. O Lord, God of truth. God of truth. What a wonderful prayer for us. It's been a prayer that's been on the lips of many people as they died. Martin Luther John Huss and others, as they breathed their last, this was what they were saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's a prayer of quiet faith. It's a prayer of trust knowing that once I take my last breath, I, 
there's nothing I can do. Even now there's nothing I can do, but once I take my last breath, it's all on God. It's always been that it's all on God. We just don't see it. We are but broken vessels. What a prayer to learn. Even in these days of the pandemic. And in these days of such violence in our culture. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. Moving on in the psalm, we read verses 6 through 8. Kind of changes the tone of it. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over to death or over to the hand of my enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. So the overarching kind of sense of this, these, this section is trust. But I trust in the Lord. He also says, I hate those who regard vain idols. And it's strange to think of that Yahweh. David hated those who trusted in vain idols. But our Lord Jesus also, he loved the whole world. But he hated the reality of those who trust in vain idols. And that whole s sense of going after vain idols is the very heart and the very beginning of the law found in Exodus 20. So let me go. We're going to take a look at it, that real quick. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Remember what I have done for you, the power that you have seen by my hand. And then here, here we go, the commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You, you shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. He's giving a, us a glimpse of that, of the glory of his name, the goodness of his name, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and the gracious God. That same language is used in Exodus 34. When he, when he gives that incredible self-revelation. But notice what he says, For I, the Lord God, I, Yahweh, Elohim. And so here we're talking about Jesus. He's a jealous God. And he visits the iniquity of the Father to the third and fourth generations in the New Covenant. We know that he visited our iniquity in his own body, in the mystery of the Trinity, in the mystery of the Trinity, on the body of His Son Jesus, and so you see how prominent in the Ten Commandments, these commandments of having no other god and not having idols. In our own context, in our own culture, we're not like Japan. We don't have idols on every corner and every house, god shelves and butsudans, the Buddhist altar with a usually a Buddha in, inside. We don't have those kinds of altars for the most part. But we have the idol of self, worshiping the creature rather than, than the creator. Evolution has, has given us license to worship self. There is no God. We, we uh, evolved from primordial muck so we can pray our father up a tree No, our idol is self. And along with the idolatry of self, we sacrifice in like kind by sacrificing our unborn children. We look in horror at cultures who practice child sacrifice. 
and yet we never consider that we are in the midst of a culture that practices child sacrifice to the God of self, to the God of selfishness. We haven't only killed 66 million children, we've killed all of their unborn descendants that would have been. Hear these words, I hate those who regard vain idols, including the vain idol of self. But I trust in the Lord. It also makes me think of the passage in 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's verse 19 and following. What do I mean then, that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. The sacrifices we are making in our country to the God of self are sacrificed to demons. They demand our blood. And we're willingly and stupidly and foolishly giving them our blood, our children's blood. But David said, I trust in the Lord. And so when you think about idolatry and about having other gods, the question is, is where are you going to put your trust? I always want to say Ghostbusters, but no, we, no, we, we put our trust in the Lord, not in idols, not in self. We don't need self-esteem. We need Christ's esteem, the knowledge of his esteem for us, by which we then love him in return. but I trust in the Lord. I trust in Jesus. I hope that you are putting your trust in Jesus and not the things of this world. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness. So he's reminding him, David is reminding himself of that steadfast, unswerving love of, of God in making a covenant with the nation of Israel. And Jesus hanging on the cross is offering up his body as the covenant sacrifice so that we may enter into a new covenant, a covenant full of loving kindness and grace and mercy and peace and hope. Because you have seen my afflictions, you have known the troubles of my soul, and you have not given me over into the hand of the enemy. So David had a time of reprieve from his enemies, even though he was greatly aff afflicted, his Soul was deeply troubled, his mind, will, and emotions. And in one sense, you could say, well, Jesus was given over into the hands of his enemies, but only for a time. But now he's, he is re resurrected, the victor. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Demons shudder at his name. Demons flee at the name of Jesus. You have set my feet in a large place, no longer hiding in fortresses or rocks or caves. And for Jesus, in a very wide place, the throne room of heaven, seated at the right hand of God, in whom we are hidden even now. We move on in the psalm. 31, 9 through 13, it says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also. Am I well acquainted with these words in these days? For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my body is wasted away. Now for David... We can apply that to David. He, we know his iniquity. The Bible never minces words. It tells it like it is, including about David's life, this man after God's own heart, and he 
breaks, as Don Mills, one of our church members, said in his debacle with Bathsheba, he broke every commandment. Well, I'm not sure of every commandment, but he broke almost all of them. My strength has failed me because of my iniquity. Iniquity is that family sin, that familial sin, that families. It's group sin. We don't really have a category for that in our culture. Japanese people would understand that fully well, that there is group sin, there is group wrongdoing. And it gets passed on. This is a sin that gets passed on from father to, to son to grand, grandson and from mother to daughter and, and so on, from parents to their children even to the third and fourth generations. So we see things like addiction passed on from generation to generation. We see things like abuse, sexual abuse or physical abuse or verbal abuse passed on from generation to generation. We see things, sins of pride passed on in families, sins of gossiping and lying and stealing. Uh, theft is sometimes passed on. My strength has failed me because of my iniquity. Sometimes a sin, our own sin and the, and the sin of our families become so overwhelming, our strength leave, leaves us. And my body has wasted away. How does that apply to Jesus, though? Because all of the, the rest of this, my life is spent with sorrow. Jesus was called a man of sorrow. We could never say that Jesus had sin because we know throughout the New Testament it says he was without sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Well, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he became our sin. In whatever, however you take that, he became our sin. And when the sin died, he died with it. And so in Jesus' case, his strength has failed because of our iniquity put on him. And his body has wasted away because of our iniquity. Because of all my adversaries, I, be, I have become a rote, re, re, reproach. I almost said roach, reproach. And I know David had become a reproach to Saul and to Saul's family. He had become a reproach to Absalom and to all the people of Israel and many times uh, his enemies and by the surrounding nations. But Jesus had certain, certainly become a reproach while hanging on the cross, especially to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. The disciples had all fleen, fled into the night. Peter had denied him. Judas had betrayed him. Those who see me in the street flee from me. As he carried the cross up to the Golgotha, I'm sure people did not want to hang around. I'm forgotten as a dead man. Out of mind, I am like a broken vessel. Jesus hanging on the cross, he was a broken vessel. A body severely broken by the torture, by the 39 lashes, by being nailed to a cross. For I have heard the slander of many. If you go into those texts which we've read in previous Psalms, when we've gone ahead to the New Testament and read about Jesus on the cross, we see everyone around him casting slander. Even the th both thieves on the cross begin by casting slander at him. Terror is on every side. He has Roman soldiers at his feet, the chief priests uh, wagging their heads, saying, he saved others. Why doesn't he come down from the cross and save himself? While they took counsel against me, while the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas and Annas took counsel against Jesus, they schemed to take away my life. They had been scheming for a long time. After meeting with the rich young ruler in which Jesus declared for mortals, eternal life is impossible, is the sense of it being, being saved. It is impossible for humankind. All things are possible for God. He starts heading back up on his journey and he's on his way to Jerusalem and the disciples follow behind him for they are afraid. And what are, of what are they afraid? They know that Jesus' life has come under threat the chief priests and, and the priests and the Pharisees and, and the scribes are all seeking to kill him, to put him to death. They scheme to take away my life. When you look at this section, it's a section of lament, something we haven't learned to do very often as Christians. I know one gal I knew, every time you saw her, she was saying, praise the Lord. You know, uh, 
uh, her brother could have gotten run over by a car and it was praise the Lord. Uh, and sometimes it felt inauthentic to me when people are always praising the Lord, no matter what happens, we're going to keep a smiling face and praise the Lord. No, there is room for lament in life. I've spent much of my life in lament, not all of it, but a good portion of my life has been spent in lament when I was young. And now I am in a season of lament again. And I know some of you are in a season of, of lament where we can go to God and we can be honest with him. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. We move on in the psalm to the fourth section, Psalm 31, verses 14 through 18. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. For David, he was hiding out in the fortresses. And again, he puts his trust in God, in, in Yahweh. And for us, we know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. I say, you are my God, you are my Elohim. And then these remarkable words, my times are in your hands. When I was first diagnosed with cancer, my brother Harry called. And he reminded me of the verse in Psalm 139 that says, all of the days set for us before one of them came to being were written in God's book. So he knows the exact number of your days. He knows the exact number of our days, of my days. My times, your times are in God's hands. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. These are also Jesus' words on the cross. I trust in you, O Lord, in Yahweh, in the mystery of the Trinity, his Father. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me, both from those human beings, Pilate and Caiaphas and Annas and the Roman soldiers and the passerby buyers and the thieves on the cross, and from those who persecute me but also from the, the enemy behind the scenes. Satan had filled Judas to betray Jesus to death. And the implication is that Jesus, Satan thought that if he could kill Jesus, he would win. He'd be able to take over everything. He would be God. How foolish. If you get the irony of that, he puts Jesus to death, and in so doing, I mean, he's the behind instigating it, it at least. And by so, so doing, the greatest blessing to ever fall on humankind is wrought in the death of Jesus. The forgiveness of sins, salvation, eternal life, eternal hope that we have in Christ. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness out of that steadfast covenant love. Jesus had kept the law, had kept loving his neighbor, had kept loving God with everything he had perfectly. He'd never failed. And so he had never broken the covenant. So he knows that God will save him. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Sheol is the place of the grave where men cannot praise God, where women cannot praise God. The Hebrew conception of death was when you died, you died. And if there was an afterlife, it was only because God would bring you to that afterlife. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul, if you, if you study scripture. It wasn't until uh, later that that um, reality that of resurrected life and the promise of eternal life was, was revealed to us through the New Testament. They had an inkling of it, but it wasn't well developed. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. You get that silent in Sheol because when you're in Sheol, there is no voice, there is no consciousness, there is nothing. There is only silence. Let the lie, lying lips be mute 
which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. You think about all the lying lips surrounding Jesus in the days of his trial and in the days of his dying, in the day of his dying. All those slanderous lips who were full of pride and contempt. And again, these two remarkable clauses or sentences from this psalm. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. My times are in your hand. So if you look at this again, it's a, it's a section of trust. It starts right off, the, right off the beginning. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. We then move along. Psalm 31, verses 19 and 20. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. And that's not the fear of punishment fear. It's, the, it's a reverential, awestruck fear which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you. David had taken refuge in Jesus, actually in Yahweh, but unbeknownst to him, it was Jesus. Before the sons of men, you hide them in secret places, in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. I love that. You hide them in the secret place of your presence. He hides us in the secret place of his presence. And get this, in the new covenant, we have become the temple a living temple made of spiritual stones. We have become the Holy of Holies, the place in which the Shekinah glory of God dwells in the person of Jesus Christ, mediated in and through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So we, were, we are always in God's presence. He has hid us in the secret place of his presence from the conspiracies of man. Boy, are there a lot of conspiracies out there today. On the left, on the right, in the middle, I can't turn around. Almost every day I turn and I hear another conspiracy theory. And the thing about conspiracy, conspiracy theories, they're always built on speculation. There's never any evidence. It's always built on speculation. Kind of the what ifs. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Ever been mistreated verbally? Sometimes in our families. Sometimes by fellow students. But you can imagine Jesus praying this on the cross. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear, fear you. And above all people, Jesus is the one who feared God perfectly which you have wrought for those who take refuge in, in you. Jesus has taken refuge in the Father. Before the sons of men, you hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracy of, of men. There is a moment at which Jesus felt the presence of God removed when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, in the very last breath, into your, into your hands I commit my spirit. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. So even while hanging on the cross, Jesus was sheltered from the lying and slanderous tongues all around him. It was the presence of God until those moments when that presence was removed, or at least seemed to be removed. When Jesus became the sin of the world, when he took on the full brunt of the law. Can you imagine what that must have been like? It goes beyond my ability to imagine or think. And so this section of the psalm is praise. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you wrought for those who take refuge in you. It's praise throughout. You hide them in the secret place of your presence. Praise for hiding them. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Then we get to the last section, Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I, have, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. So here we have bless, David again blessing Yahweh, we blessing Jesus. For he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. So you think about David, he was in some kind of city at this point, besieged. It was a city, not, not a mountain stronghold. 
And David is remembering that loving kindness, that Hesed love that is promised because of the blood of the covenant to be for David, even to the point of death. And in the new covenant, Jesus was faithful to the covenant, to the covenant, even to giving up his blood that we might live, that we might be forgiven. And in Jesus' day, when the city of Jerusalem, it was besieged by the Romans, overrun by the Romans under their rule. And in a sense, Jesus is besieged by the very men who are purporting to worship Yahweh and worshiping God. He's surrounded by them, taunting at him, crucify him, crucify him. I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Nevertheless, you have heard the voice of my supplications. David had put his trust in God, knowing that God was going to hear his prayers. And Jesus, knowing that God had heard his prayers, his supplications, when I cried to you. And then here comes the response. Not just to David, but those who were with him in the city being besieged, his fellow men. And to Jesus, all those who would come with Jesus, who were in Jesus on the cross. Oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. Interestingly enough, under the law, it was love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your might, with all your soul. In the new covenant, we love because he first loved us. He gives us a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. There's no way in our human flesh that we could ever love in the way that Jesus has loved us by giving up his life for us on the cross. When you look at love in, in, in that wonderful chapter in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. When you are honest about that kind of love, I realize I fall so far short of that kind of love. Love keeps no record of wrong suffered. Never brings up the past to anybody. Love never seeks its own. Most of our love is selfish love. We love because of what we benefit from it. At least in of, our, in of ourselves. Love always trusts. Always perseveres. Love never fails. My love fails. And I know your love fails. We have probably failed each other in our life. And then it says, all you his godly ones, well, in the old, old covenant would be those who are keeping the law, who are living by the Ten Commandments and that command not to have other idols and so on. In the new covenant, we find that we have been given everything we need for godliness in Christ Jesus. So we don't look to ourselves. We don't look to our own ability to love or to be, live a godly life. We look to Jesus. He is a lover of, of our souls. And I think as we live in the love of God, that Niagara Falls of his love pouring over us, then the love flows out to those around us. Not a love of our making, but the love of the Spirit, the love of God. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. Well, in that day, it would have been the proud doer of the law and keeping the covenant. In our day, Jesus is the one who kept the covenant on our behalf. Because he kept it and took all the penalty of breaking the law and breaking the covenant on his own body. If you'll notice in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, there is no curse. There is only blessing. For we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. And you read that torrent of a waterfall of Paul's praise for what God has done for us in Ephesians chapter 1 verses or Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 17. It's a it torrid, torrent of praise, and it's none of us. It's all of God and what Jesus did for us. He's the proud doer. He's the one who is faithful. And then it finally says, be strong and let your heart take courage. We find these words all through the Hebrew scriptures. Joshua commanding the people to be strong and take courage as they enter the promised land. In our life, as we face pandemic, as we face uh, violence as we face this injustice of racism. We are commanded to be strong and let your heart take courage. But where do we find our strength? All you who hope in the Lord. Our strength is in him. Our hope is in him. Our courage is in him. He is our strength. Again, from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, 
Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. And so in this psalm, you have the response, love the Lord. I do love the Lord, but I love him because he has so loved me. It's always a responsive love. We love because he first loved us. He preserves those who put their trust in him. Jesus preserves the faithful, those who are full of faith. We always make faithfulness a stick to itiveness. Faithfulness is, is, is the idea of people who are full of trust and faith in Yahweh, in God. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all of you who hope in the Lord. Are you hoping in the Lord today? Three significant lines from this psalm, which are near and dear to my heart in these days. Into your hands I commit my spirit. My times are in your hand. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Amen. Well, again, thank you for joining me today. The Psalm of David, Psalm 31. I'll be back tomorrow with Psalm 32 and with prayer again. Please pray for our nation. Pray for reconciliation for peace, for justice, but more than that, that God's will will be done. Let's close in prayer. Father, I pray that you would bring justice into our nation, that you would return justice into our nation, that you would return peace into our, into our nation that you would return safety and joy to all people in our nation. Father, our nation and our world is in turmoil. And yet your loving hand is allowing it. Are you trying to get our attention, Lord? You have mine. And even having said that, I know I fall sh so far short. All I have, all we have is in you. All we have is you, Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit and God the Father who is for us. If God is for us, if you are for us, then who can be against us? So we pray that we would be like light shining in the darkness that all of us as Christians across this nation of every ethnicity would join together in one body, in one spirit, in one mind and speak truth into this culture. I pray that you would give us ears and eyes to understand that we are citizens of a heavenly kingdom, that this world is not our home, that we do not become lovers of this world, but we become lovers of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray solely that your good work will be accomplished, that your word would not return void, that whatever you are doing in the midst of all of this, your work would be accomplished, and that we might be your voice, your heart, your embrace, your encouragement, your joy in the midst of despair, the hope that you have given us, an eternal hope that we are eternal beings now living forever and that we might speak these words that we might be your voice and your feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace give us words give us boldness give us clarity and give us opportunity lord and again i pray that you'd fill us with an extraordinary measure of your spirit throughout this day and throughout this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our blessing today is from 2 John, verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us in truth and love. Amen.